Our first speaker is Bruce Bell from Facet Homes. I've known Bruce for 10 years and he's one of the leading lights in digital fabrication for residential homes. Today he's going to be talking about some of the research he's carried out over the last year into digital manufacturing and what's improved since he first came up with the systems that he uses today. He's also going to look at how BIM and manufacturing as a process can be connected together with the suppliers. This is important for the next stage as architecture moves to digital fabrication. Hello there, uh, I'm Bruce Bell. I am the founder of Facet Homes. Um, let me just share my screen with you so we can see the presentation. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about the gap that exists between BIM and the supply chain. Um, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of background first on Facet Homes. So uh, today we're gonna, we're gonna show you a little bit about Facet Homes, uh, how we are vertically integrated. I'm going to describe a little bit about how we use BIM um, and how that relates to the wider industry. Do they do uh, the same type of things? Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, the content conundrum and uh, a little bit about our new venture, which is called Confactor. So first of all, um, let's talk about Facet Homes. What is Facet Homes? Well, we are a um, design and digital manufacturer of one-off homes. We've been creating one-off homes for private clients uh, for over 10 years now. Um, we use BIM at the center of everything we do. Um, with an approach that we broadly call BIM to manufacture. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about how uh, we can apply the underlying philosophy uh, and technical thinking to the wider challenges that exist um, within the construction industry. So Facet Homes is an example of a company that we would describe as being vertically integrated. Um, and when I say vertically integrated, I mean we do everything. Uh, concept design, planning, costing, technical design, manufacturing code, manufacturing, assembly, construction, construction management, supply chain management, and handover. And all of this is direct to the end user. Um, and so it's been quite a long time now that we've been running the business, but I have to say that I still get excited about being able to get involved with the tiny little details um, from something like this, which is a structural tree column. So looking at uh, kind of millimeter bend radiuses from a, a digitally manufactured um, structure, and also at the same time thinking about uh, the whole thing, the end result um, uh, and, and the bigger picture. So the original idea um, is, is kind of to deliver great homes with precise details uh, to happy customers. And I think we can show that we're doing that now. And that was the idea since we uh, started up such a long, long time ago. But over the last 12 months, uh, I started to ask myself, how does this relate to the wider industry? Um, do other companies harness the power of BIM to the same extent that Facet Homes does? Um, so to answer that question, first of all, we have to have a look at what Facet Homes do. How do we use BIM? Um, and so I'll take you through some of the things that we do. So first of all, um, this is what we call our Facet Chassis. This is our kind of main structural framing system. It's like a big wooden, wooden Lego and we design it and deliver it, um, which is our primary structural system. We do the, all of that in Revit, and there's no requirement for downstream or upstream data checking. Uh, all of the action happens in Revit with the correct level of detail, and then all that information flows directly downstream through to our production process. So we don't have the kind of uh, secondary design system where you have to design it in another secondary system, re-export re it back into uh, your main design program, uh, check it against everything else for coordination and there's a kind of back and forth. So we're really just designing everything we need to in one single source in Revit and then all of that information flows straight through into production. Um, the second 
aspect. Oopsie. Um, one of the other things we do is porting data uh, direct to digital manufacturing processes. So um, what we're able to do is create components which are an exact physical match uh, to the actual design. Um, these are commonly referred to as a, a, a digital twin. Um, we also uh, own and operate our own family content, which 100% matches uh, the product or component. Um, we also have created a kind of um, family content, which is highly adaptive, which, which has all the various features and design options from the product. So finishes, sub options, opening details, like all of that stuff is, is inherent within the um, BIM models themselves. We also um, are able to produce uh, as built information uh, without having to remodel it. You know, the, the information that we create is the information that gets built. So we don't have to go back and, and redo our uh, design information once the building is complete. Um, we've developed uh, a BIM to costing system and a BIM to order system um, through what we call unified classification uh, that covers all aspects of the business. So from accounts through to ordering, through to design, through to Revit details, standards, everything carries the same universal code system. So you can pick up uh, any object in any part of the company and you can find out information about it. And this allows us to do things like uh, real-time um, uh, profit and loss evaluation. We also um, provide our third party manufacturers with data which is direct from our BIM model and it's directly inputted into their um, production information systems. So, for example, um, our window manufacturer, uh, we provide them with final frame sizes and all the tolerances and all the offsets and all the information that they need as a data set and this information goes straight into their uh, production information system so that we are avoiding the uh, usual manual handling of data and quoting which takes um, several weeks so we get instant quotes from the manufacturer and we get really short lead times so those being the kind of way that we utilize uh, BIM, the question is, you know, how does that compare? Uh, has the industry caught up? So we spent a lot of time uh, researching and having meetings with leading architects, contractors, manufacturers, uh, BIM library operators, uh, including Scott Brownrigg, Katera, Lend Lease, Velfac, and, um, and quite a few more. Um, all of these companies have uh, serious aspirations to be digital, to be connected, to leverage their own BIM models. But we identified um, a massive gap uh, in the underlying BIM infrastructure, and it limits what, what these companies can achieve. The, the gap we identified lies between the design and contracting team who are operating the BIM model and the manufacturer suppliers who uh, we would like to say they don't really speak BIM. It's not really their language. Um, the suppliers that do speak BIM um, tend to be the, what we call a tier one supplier of large and very integrated components, such as structural framing, whereas the, where there is a requirement for them to collaborate directly with the design team on a BIM model. So therefore, it's necessary for them to become uh, more advanced. Whereas um, it, with the large BIM teams, we found that where for the smaller components and products that are more frequently appearing in the, in the designs, um, we found that the design teams were creating their own versions of suppliers' products. Even when there's content that's out there ready to download, um, and, and also the, the, the problem was that they, these companies and architects and contractors don't have the resource to create the content to the kind of level that we do that gives real uh, value. We couldn't operate our, our business without 
extremely high quality content uh, with all the various features in it. So we started looking at this and there's all these um, uh, sites out there with content on them. Um, why is it uh, that design teams would choose to build their own content? Um, what's so wrong with the content that's out there uh, that would make them want to build something from scratch? And this was kind of perplexing. And we, we, we asked ourselves, well, what's, what's going on here? And this is what we call the, the content conundrum. Um, so what is wrong with the content and what causes it to be so bad? Um, let's think of it from a, a user perspective. So first of all, you, as a user, you're going to say, well, what site should I download the content from? Uh, and you go out there and for any manufacturer's product, you might find multiple different sites hosting similar content of, of the same product, but yet made at different times to different standards. Um, so we don't know which one to choose. Uh, do we know if the content that is able to download, um, do we know if it matches the current manufacturer's products? We don't really know. We have no idea if it's up to date when it was, we, we can see when it was manufactured uh, or when the content was created, but it doesn't tell us if it, if it matches the supplier's um, current product. Do we know if we can buy it in the region that we're in? So a lot of the websites, hosting websites are international, but you know, I know I can't buy uh, an American window manufacturer's product in the UK. You know, they're all regional. I have to, I have to buy windows from a uh, UK distributor and manufacturer. Other issues are, how do I know what's inside the content file before I download it? Um, what we found is that the, the, the hosting sites have individual files of products but they don't really bear a resemblance to the manufacturer's product catalog, which is really essential for understanding what the product is and how we download it. Um, it's, it's very abstract. The other issues are the quality of the models vary massively. So we have, um, some have a good level of details, some have too much details, some have not enough. Um, uh, some have good sub options and specification, while others don't. Uh, some models are very robust in their geometry and others fail when um, you try and change the size of them. They just break. Also, the, the fundamental uh, way that a lot of the hosting of content is designed is that it only shows the product itself. So you download an individual um, uh, file uh, of, let's say, a door or a window. And it shows the door or window, but it doesn't show it in context. It doesn't show how it relates to the other building details. Um, and, and actually, uh, the other building details appear in the uh, manufacturer's product catalogs and show exactly what the interface details are and how it relates. So it's very abstracted and doesn't really help you as a designer. Um, and also, you might find that once you've downloaded the content, um, you bring it into your model and it, it doesn't quite match. You, you, can't, uh, you can't insert it into the wall or roof or whatever it happens to be because the wall is thicker or is slightly different build up or whatever it happens to be. And then the other big uh, limitation is that the, because of the variability of the content that's out there, there isn't really the opportunity for extracting data at scale to push things into production as we do at Facet Homes. So, you know, why, why is that? You know, what's the reason for this content being quite so poor? Um, and on the whole, the content is being produced by the manufacturers. And unfortunately, the manufacturers, they don't really speak BIM. You know, they're, they're um, advanced uh, product designers, industrial designers, engineers, and they understand their products and they have their own design systems um, for industrial manufacturing. Um, and they have their own advanced production management systems. They have all sorts of stuff, but they don't really speak the language of BIM and they don't really know how to get value from it. So what happens is the, the manufacturers end up spending very little money on these bits of content. So somebody says, oh, uh, we, need a, we need a BIM model. And they spend a couple of thousand pounds on a BIM model, upload it onto uh, a website, maybe pay a monthly fee for doing it, but that's basically it, it's all done, great. Um, 
and uh, it's uh, it's a very um, difficult for them uh, and difficult for the users to use their content. And what you can see here in the background is actually um, our data analysis from just one manufacturer's um, content that's out there. They have five different um, five different sites hosting their content various different degrees of usability of uh, level of detail um, very difficult to understand which products or which content we should be using as a designer and this is typical of what we find out there on in the market at the moment um, so we see changes in the market we see um, companies starting to be more proactive to resolve these issues so um, companies like Hilti have really invested heavily in um, their BIM center and what they do is they actually reach into um, the design team's model and kind of design with them alongside them their products so they put in all of their fixing systems and tray systems and all the stuff that's associated with Hilti and they kind of do that as a service make sure it's all correct and uh, provide all that data and costing at the end of it. Um, and the question I, I, I ask myself is, well, that's, that's great, but is it scalable? You know, imagine if all the suppliers were doing that. Could you imagine like thousands of suppliers all reaching into somebody's BIM model and organizing it and fixing it, especially when it has relationships to other objects? I don't think it's very practical. So this is what we've been working on to try and address some of these problems. Um, it's called Confactor. It's a, a new venture which we've just started up. Um, we've been kind of working through the ideas behind it for about, about eight months. Um, we're not yet uh, live, but I'm gonna show you kind of broadly uh, what the ideas behind it are. Um, so the, the core parts to Confactor um, are content creation, um, getting good content, distribution, better ways of distributing the information to the design team, and allowing the contractor to take that BIM model and use it for ordering. So that translates into manufacturer certified content, um, which means we're talking about content that can be trusted, that we can use and that we can guarantee actually represents the manufacturer's product. We're talking about a, a virtual showroom for the design team to access the information rather than individual floating RFA files. And we are uh, creating a procurement platform for the contractors to extract the data and provide it uh, via the platform to the manufacturer which will allow for instant quotation um, and easy uh, ordering. So just in a little bit more detail. So the manufacturer's certified content. So what, what we're really doing is actually going and working with the manufacturer, understanding exactly what their product is, understanding what production management systems they have, and creating content that reflects that rather than just looking straight at the product and, and, and um, creating some kind of uh, BIM version of it, we have to understand what is the data that they need? Well, what are their inputs? What is their production information system? What's their estimating? And create BIM that matches that information so that they can get value out of it. Once they can get value out of it, then they can invest in it. But at the, with what's happened previously is there's not really much value for the manufacturers beyond um, marketing. So what we get, what we're doing is creating, um, creating and managing all of their content. So we've got a BIM management policy. Um, we are making sure that we're matching the current product catalog. We are bench testing the um, content creation to make sure that it's uh, able to create uh, the um, quotations exactly and accurately. That has all of the sub design features in the BIM model, um, you know, finishes, design details, all of that stuff that gets that goes through into production. And uh, we are creating 
uh, standardized data outputs so that the manufacturers can actually put the information straight into their um, systems. So a lot of the big manufacturers are using uh, systems such as SAP production management systems that are highly sophisticated, highly sophisticated, and, and are already existing to interface with. Um, we are also making the, the content interoperable so that um, manufacturers' content can be swapped for other um, bits of their own content, or windows can be swapped with other windows, or doors can be swapped with other doors, or ducts can be duct swapped with other ducts. That, for, that everything has got a standardized base to it. Um, we're also uh, managing the content on an annual basis. Uh, to make sure that any kind of um, uh, design updates or product updates are reflected in the content, that this is an ongoing um, uh, service to ensure for the users that it's absolutely uh, exact. So what the users get is um, what we call the virtual showroom. So it's a space which shows all of the products in one space how they're intended to be used, how they relate to other materials, products, interfaces. Um, so showing the other build-ups, showing the kind of detail for the 3D interface details, which traditionally you'll get a bunch of 2D details with a product, uh, which show you know that very fine level of detail, screw fixings, uh, um, sealants, all that stuff. That will be shown in the virtual showroom. Uh, that the virtual showroom shows the full product catalog in one space so that you can effectively wander through it and look and understand, oh, right, that's the window I want, or is it this one? And you have a look at it in a kind of virtual space, much more like you would do if you went to the manufacturer's own showroom uh, and had a conversation with the, with the um, uh, sellers. Um, and we're going to do it with an uh, easy point of access, which is free to the design team. Then the procurement platform, um, essentially what it does is it, it identifies factor compatible uh, content and it uh, extracts the data from that content. Uh, it checks that the content has not been tampered with. Um, ports the information over to the manufacturer's um, production information management system or directly into their API, depending on if that's the position they're in. Um, and then that allows the manufacturer to instantly input that, that data into their quoting system and spring back a quote to, to the contractor. And bearing in mind that most kind of highly complex um, the quotes with a lot of specification on them typically take two to three weeks, a minimum to get turned around. This really gives the manufacturers an edge on uh, getting uh, products sold because as we know, everybody's always late. Everybody, everybody needs everything yesterday. Um, and we're getting that instant pricing. So what we're essentially aiming to do is to allow other people, other companies to be more like Facet to, um, be more productive, be more ambitious in their designs um, without breaking a sweat. Um, and I think if we can close this underlying gap in the infrastructure, then uh, everybody can collectively be more ambitious. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Um, if you'd like to get in touch uh, and you think this sounds interesting or you would want to participate in our kind of beta program, or, or just generally to have a chat about it, please do get in touch. Um, I, I love talking about this kind of stuff. If you think it doesn't work or you think there's problems with it, again, please, please give me a call. Uh, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being with me today. Thank you. Our next presenter is Mark Taylor, the Digital Construction Vendor Manager for the Royal Baum Group. Mark joins us to share his digital fabrication experiences from working with 3D printed concrete. So good afternoon, my name is Mark Taylor. Uh, I'm a senior digital construction manager working at Royal Baum Group in the Netherlands. I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, manufacturing and construction at Royal Baum Group. So Royal Baum Group, 7.2 billion turnover um, construction organization headquartered out in the Netherlands, around 20,000 employees 
um, uh, working worldwide. Our main focus areas are, uh, are in the UK and Ireland, um, the Netherlands and Germany and Belgium, uh, but we work in worldwide uh, on projects as well. We work in civil engineering, um, in rail and tunnelling, uh, and also construction and properties, so building stadia and hospitals and, and apartments and the like. So uh, I'm going to talk a little about industrialised construction. Um, and industrialised construction is, is the application of uh, manufacturing techniques in the built environment. And um, a recent industry report identified sort of five mega trends in this area. And um, I'm just going to focus on those areas and show what we're doing around the business in relation to these. So big data analytics. So in construction, we're using big data analytics to look at things like um, here in this example, we're surveying uh, roads uh, using like a Google camera, Google truck. Um, and this is to support the maintenance programs we have in the Netherlands. Um, so we can we don't need to go out and physically check uh, the road surfaces. Uh, in robotics and automation, um, we have a number of projects, but um, one of the more um, recent ones is uh, Hinkley Point project in the UK, where we're using um, machine guidance systems for uh, installing in this example uh, anchors um, and this this allows us to do this based on data uh, from the designers um, going straight into the machines uh, uh, and placing the anchors in the right positions. Um, Prefabrication so uh, a, a large component of industrialized construction so in prefabrication, um, we are producing full volumetric um, modules for um, uh, housing in Ireland. Um, we are also creating um, volumetric apartment buildings as well. Um, you know, these are 90% uh, complete before they're delivered to site. And also uh, using panelised construction in our Sky Factory concept, um, we've been doing this for a number of years where we basically um, bring everything together in a factory environment um, that is uh, lifting uh, over uh, the construction site. So as you can see here on the top left, our workers are inside a dry space installing uh, um, the deck ready for the next lift of panels. Uh, onto the deck, which are here in the bottom left hand corner. We're also doing multi trade assemblies using uh, um, for MEP um, into our project. So we have, uh, we coordinate the design um, uh, digitally and then we fabricate all the modules and uh, install in segment sections on site in our projects. So IoT. Um, this is, a, this is a couple of bridges that we installed in the Netherlands as well, and we're uh, now hooked up to that those bridges, streaming data live on their um, on how they're being used, um, and this is enabling us to have um, um, implement uh, better work uh, uh, maintenance regimes because we understand how the bridges are being operated and if they're being operated outside of their designed envelope. Uh, so that we can make adjustments in um, how they're operated or how uh, we train staff to operate them in the future to avoid uh, uh, them being stuck open or something like that uh, because of a, a problem with them. And then in additive manufacturing, so this is the newer focus for us in BAM. Um, we are looking at additive manufacturing in the construction space uh, and particularly 3D concrete printing. So we design, we print and we assemble. Um, so we have a, um, a 3D concrete printing factory based out of the Netherlands. Uh, and this is born out of um, years of development. So this started way back in 2000 
with our uh, materials partner, Sangaban, um, where they developed um, uh, the, the mortar mix for 3D concrete printing. Uh, fast forward to 2017, um, we installed the first 3D concrete printed bridge uh, in uh, the Netherlands, a cycle bridge. Um, 2018, we started working on housing. Uh, 2019, um, we opened our factory uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, we also started to intensify our investigations into how we fully digitalize our factory setup and ordering processes. And we uh, started a commission on the world's longest 3D concrete printed bridge, about 30 meters long um, also. So uh, this is the bridge in Khirmet, um being printed. Uh, it was based initially off some sketches where we were looking at how to uh, reduce material in the uh, bridge deck and uh, provide the strength we needed. Um, and this is the bridge uh, installed in situ being load tested. And then this is it on opening day. So um, it's now fully been in operation uh, for nearly three years um, or three years. Um, we also, as I said before, we've opened the world's first uh, production location for 3D printing uh, of structural concrete elements. So this is now um, churning out uh, all sorts of um, elements for different projects uh, around the world. Um, so why 3D concrete printing? So um, while we see, uh, as, you, as I showed before, in design and preparation and monitoring and in uh, management, we um, we uh, uh, it's full. You know, these environments are very digitalized, digitized, and um, we saw in the execution phase that um, you know we're still using very traditional method, methods um, uh, out on site. So we saw an opportunity to improve uh, and, and adopt. Uh, more more manufacturing type processes, even in the uh, structural uh, uh, development of the project. So uh, we have uh, in this process the advantages are we have you know one model from the design to the construction. So we don't re we're not reinventing the wheel constantly. Um, we have sort of free form and affordable design because we're printing it. We don't need expensive molds and um, uh, uh, to to uh, to to create these different shapes. Um, we uh, only put material where we need it, so there's less waste um, in terms of uh, materials only printed uh, where the strength is needed. Um, and we can also add in, not only do we have the compressive strength of the concrete, but we can add in steel, steel cable uh, in each of the layers to create um, uh, tensile strength in the elements uh, being printed. So a new way of designing. So um, now we design the object, uh, taking 3D printing into account. So we work with customers and clients uh, at an early stage to look at how we can solve a problem uh, rather than build 3D concrete printing into our process. We'll print a prototype. Um, and we'll test and validate the prototype and adapt uh, to suit uh, any uh, anything we we uh, see in our testing phase, and then we move to uh, uh, production and installation. Um, and once we've designed uh, one element in, and the principles are set, we can then use that multiple times for different uh, elements using the same principles. So. We use parametric design for this, so we can uh, mass produce um, unique designs. So our factory, um, this is an example where we're using the parametric design uh, uh, in the north of Holland. So we've got four bicycle bridges that we're going to print. Um, we've designed a um, we have our partners have designed uh, um, the bridge deck um, using uh, a parametric model. Um, this allows us 
based on certain constraints to have multiple designs uh, for each of the bridges, but based on the same principles. So this is one version, and then this is all four. And all of these bridges are fundamentally the same. They just uh, the the they've just been stretched or, or uh, um, made wider or longer to suit the condition that they're in. But they're working within the same design constraints and uh, which are in the parametric model. We've also, uh, as I mentioned previously, started work on the large, longest 3D printed bridge in the world. Um, this is a visualization of the bridge. Um, it will be printed in segments like this um, and installed on site. So this is the uh, first segment that we uh, test segment. So this is the one that we uh, printed and tested. Uh, this is in our factory, flow tested. Um, these are the uh, columns. These are installed on site and uh, filled full of concrete and rebar um, to, to um, so that these are basically a, a formwork solution. Um, these, this is the base where it will, the bridge will be installed, uh, being uh, with the, the piers being cast. We're also doing more um, sort of basic stuff in terms of um, uh, this is a retaining wall within a highway. Um, this allowed us to install it, um, you know, fairly complex shape uh, very quickly within uh, um, a tight site next to a highway. Um, so we, you know, reduced, there was a reduction, uh, the costs were the same as doing it traditionally as it were, as they were doing it um, uh, with the 3D concrete printed method. But we um, saw reduction in labour and, and reduction in leading time, which then means we're on site less um, and um, we're not putting, um, we've got a, a shorter road closure and uh, our operatives are not uh, in an unsafe environment any longer than they need to be. Um, this is an example of some head walls that we've printed in uh, um, Driebergen Zeist. Um, and this is, uh, uh, usually these would have to be cast in several lifts um, and uh, uh, using fairly complex formwork. Um, in this example, we have printed uh, the um, formwork, uh, the, the head wall, sorry, in our factory in segments. And then these are craned into, into, lo into location. Uh, on site um, and then they can be backfilled straight away um, and, and, and put into um, operation much, much quicker. We also have standard um, uh, parametric components that are run through the factory. So this is a staircase that we, uh, a slope stair uh, on our rail um, projects. So the site teams will call uh, the office, uh, the factory, and uh, request provide the dimensions for the stair. We'll stretch the uh, stair to suit those dimensions and then quickly print a slope stair. And then these are installed uh, on track side uh, to allow maintenance access and access to project sites uh, in a safe uh, uh, way. Uh, this is an example of street furniture, actually, and it's the first UK asset in uh, Netwell Rails infrastructure that has uh, that has been uh, 3D printed. Um, it's a it's a bench uh, down in Dawlish. Um, so we're uh, starting to bring these into uh, these systems into different markets. Um, we've also uh, just completed a project. Um, in Belgium, and this is a swimming pool. So very complex geometry for the swimming pool. Uh, printed the swimming pool liner, and then this was uh, just lifted into um, into position on site, um, and and then uh, uh, tiled uh, as a finish afterwards. And this is it on site, uh, put into place. Um, so our latest project is a milestone housing project in the Netherlands. Um, 
again, working with our partners, um, Vitamin and Boss um, and Weber, we've developed uh, the concept for these houses uh, and tested the solution. So we have uh, printed some of our largest elements to date. As you can see, um, these are printed in the factory in, in segments on uh, lifting slabs. So once the elements are printed, um, we then crane them out of the factory uh, onto uh, transport uh, and take them uh, to the site in uh, sections. Um, so the, I think the highest segment is up to three metres tall uh, in, in these pictures. And this is the factory running uh, and printing uh, the wall sections. And then these wall sections have um, ties in them and then they're filled full of a uh, foamed insulation um, to, so that they're fully insulated panels um, once they arrive on site. So this is the factory um, and this is our flying factory um, system. So we also uh, have a setup that we can uh, take to different locations. And this is a conference in the, in the United States. Um, so we um, uh, have used this setup for demonstrations to customers and clients. Um, and also um, we use it for our um, design, uh, our, our design development uh, topics as well. Um, but in the future, maybe something like this system would be um, used on project sites as well uh, for printing in uh, elements in situ. So thank you for your time um, and I'll see you on the panel. Our next presenter is Alexander Turk, the CEO and co-founder of Aditive. Alex is a technology enthusiast who is deeply passionate about digitalization and he joins us today to ask and answer the question, will shortcrete save construction? So welcome to my presentation and Martin, thanks for having me at Next Build this year. Will shortcrete save the world or at least construction? That's a bold question to ask, you might wonder. And who is this gentleman asking the question? My name is Alex Turk. I'm CEO and co-founder of Additive. I'm a mathematician by training and a former strategy consultant to the tech industry. So in essence, I'm a tech guy. And I've been in the cons construction industry for slightly more than a year. Yep, it's a bold question for someone like me to ask. In this one year in construction though, I've learned key, two key things. And I've learned these two key things from talking to various stakeholders along the entire value chain, from investors over architects to construction companies, precasters, structural engineers, literally everyone involved in the construction value chain. The first thing I've learned is humans need buildings. Buildings are really important to humanity. And people tend to forget about that. They tend to forget about it because they are either professionally involved with buildings, such as all of you. They tend to forget about it because buildings are everywhere around them, every day and the majority of the day. But I just want to reinstate buildings are really important to humans. They provide shelter, housing, offices for people to work in, and infrastructure for people to travel. And when I was young, I always wanted to work with software and computers. This was the new stuff. This was the cool stuff. But if you look at how big the construction industry is and how much of an impact construction and buildings have on people's life, I think now taking technology into the construction industry is something that really gets me excited. So in essence, I think what you do in the construction industry and what we do together is really important to humans. And the second thing I've learned is construction is about to change. And I've heard that from literally everyone and anyone I've talked to in the construction industry. I've heard things such as, we need more productization. We need more prefabrication. And of course, 
We need digitalization. And everyone is ready to start that process. Now, what's our role? What is Additive's role in changing the construction industry? We are a startup. We are headquartered in Hamburg, Germany. The company was founded in 2019, so slightly more than a year ago. We currently have a team of 10. It's a very diverse team. It involves software engineers, mechanical engineers, civil engineers, material scientists. It's a very, very, very diverse team. And our roots date back to an academic research project which, in which three of my co-founders engaged and that today built the technological nucleus of our business. So let's take a look at what we do. Here's a quick video impression for you. I hope you enjoyed the quick video and I now want to talk to you about three things. Why we do what we do at Additive, what it is that we do at Additive and how we do it. Let's start with the most important one, why. Why is Additive doing what we do every day? First of all, because humans need buildings and we have already discussed that, but that's what really drives us out of bed in the morning because we know that what we do ultimately has a big impact on people's life. Second, shortage of skilled labor. When I talk to precast companies, when I talk to construction companies, I hear a lot that the workforce is aging, many retirements are coming up and they have really big challenges recruiting adequate talent for their construction sites and for their precast factories in the next years. And that has challenge, brings challenges to both the company, but also from a macroeconomic perspective, because ultimately it means that the output volumes in construction will shrink. Productivity has been flat for decades, and now that we lack the workforce, it ultimately means there will be less output of the construction industry, and that means less buildings, less housing, less offices, and delayed infrastructure projects. Third reason for the why of what we do is sustainability. We live in a time of climate change, yet the construction industry is responsible for a huge part of greenhouse gas emissions. Specifically, cement is responsible for 8% of global CO2 emissions. And we have to act on that quickly. How can we do that? And the last reason that is on our list is cost kills variety. And that's the one I get a lot when I talk to architects. And I have to say, I agree. Of course, not every building is a greenfield project where you start from zero, from scratch. But on the other hand, I wouldn't like every building to look the same, even if there is cost pressure in this world, because it would destroy inspiration and also the industry wouldn't keep improving if things all converge to the same solution. So probably truth is somewhere between. 
And we want to contribute to that. We want to stop cost from killing variety. And I know for a fact that many architects, whenever they deviate from standard designs, they even have challenges determining the cost of what they planned quickly. And once they have then obtained that cost, every deviation from standard will be rolled back and they will stick with the standard again because the cost of their individual design was too high. So, what do we do to address the issues I just mentioned? At the very core of what we do is our product, the Concrete Editor. It's an integrated 3D printer for concrete, and it works with Shotcrete. It outputs ready-to-use elements with maximum dimensions of 11 by 4 by 4 meters. These elements include, include the reinforcement, which is very special because we can do it in Shotcrete. They include built-in parts, and they are ready to install. The process is moldless. It requires no formwork, which means we also avoid any waste from formwork. We print our elements on a steel pallet, which provides for a smooth surface on one side, and then all the other surfaces we will smoothen and post-process after the printing. The printer can be deployed flexibly, both in precast plants but also on construction sites. That is why we've put it into containers. And it builds on proven technology. Shotcrete has been around for decades and is well known. Everything we had to do is to improve the Shotcrete process so it works with 3D printing. If we look at the hardware components of our printer, I will start with the silos that's where we store raw materials such as cement. And we ultimately work with local raw materials, which again contributes to our, to our objective of sustainability. We don't require large volume materials to be transported over long distance. These raw materials are then continuously batched into fresh concrete during the process in our integrated batching plant. The concrete will be transported to the primary robot which in turn applies the material using our proprietary spraying nozzle. A secondary robot will, in parallel, smoothen the surface, integrate built-in parts, integrate reinforcement, do all the other manual activities that you would typically have when you build a concrete element. The transportation system, for example, is one way to integrate our printer easily into a precast plant. And of course, there are many control systems within the printer that orchestrate all the different elements. Our objective is to provide a turnkey solution to the market, which means our product is a lot more than just hardware. We want to solve a problem of our users, a pain point, automation pain point, for example. That's why we go beyond the hardware. We provide at the same time the concrete know-how, recipes for example, and of course a whole bunch of software. And software is both in the printer, control systems for example, um, a user front-end on the printer that you can use to start and stop processes, but it's also a cloud-based backend system that allows our users to create print jobs and to schedule their production. Ultimately, our goal is to create revolutionary efficiency in concrete construction. And efficiency has two sides. One is the productivity and automation side. How can we create a, an end-to-end -end high degree of automation? And the other side of efficiency is sustainability. How can we be as, as efficient as possible with the material, with the raw materials we consume. And this paradigm of revolutionary efficiency has influenced many of our design decisions during the engineering process. That's why we work with industrial robots instead of gantry systems. It's why we print concrete modules instead of printing entire buildings. Because we ultimately believe that this will allow for a higher degree of automation if you look at the process end-to-end. -end. 
Of course, we've also looked at processes such as cleaning and replenishing, and we found good solutions for those to maintain and achieve a high degree of end-to-end -end automation. Additive is a technology provider. I told you before, I'm a tech guy, and Additive is a tech company. We provide our technology to the market, to our users in the construction industry. We do not print concrete elements ourselves. Our users print concrete elements by applying our technology. And we think that the time of digital in construction has come now, and especially the time of 3D printing has come now. And in fur in, in, to further drive the adoption of such technology in the construction industry, we believe that simplicity is key. That's why we keep all the processes and all the user interfaces in our product as simple as possible. And we also apply the principle of simplicity to our business model. Our users should not have to invest in such technology, but rather pay for using it, using very simple metrics such as output volumes. Finally, let's take a look at how we do it and also why Additive is where we are after just one year of operations. First of all, we've listened, and we've listened from the very beginning. We've listened to all the stakeholders along the construction value chain, to what their pain points are and what their beliefs for the future are. We've then taken this learning and engineered a product around it in an agile process. And Agile is a process that helps you to always know what your priorities are. It comes from the software world. And at Additive, we've learned how to also apply it to hardware engineering and to material engineering. And that has been a true accelerator of our engineering processes. And lastly, most of the team are engineers and we have an engineering mindset. We are a tech company with an engineering mindset, which means we push each other <clears throat> until we find the best solution for the problem at hand. And we can go really, really deep into such technical solution. So let me conclude what to expect from us. First, you will see our printers, our concrete editors live in the field next year, and you will see them print concrete elements. And secondly, as we add more talent to the team, you will see our growth and our progress accelerate even further. Thank you very much. And let's jointly work towards revolutionary efficiency in concrete construction. And I'm looking forward to meeting you in the Q&A later. Hello, and welcome to day three of NextBuild Virtual, our first uh, online event. Thank you, COVID. Um, so the first day we had uh, kind of some out there presentations from people in research looking at um, uh, robots and generative design and uh, uh, futures. The second day we had people who were developing really innovative software now, also uh, some consultancy and uh, uh, observations on the market. And then today we focused on digital construction. Um, and this today we've had uh, Bruce Bell from Facet Homes, Mark Taylor from Royal Baum Group, and Alexander Turk from Additive. Now I say Additive, Alexander, is that right? Or is it Additive? We go with Additive. We just uh, additive. Okay. Tweet, <laughs> tweet the, uh, the E into the word, yes. <laughs> okay. AE in Germany is going to, oh, sorry, uh, AE combined. So, um, yeah, well, great presentations, really interesting stuff. Uh, Bruce has presented for us before, um, and I'm very happy to welcome him back. Um, Mark from uh, BAM, I've uh, visited uh, BAM construction sites and uh, their robotic arm free printing in Heathrow, uh, and Alexander, uh, his company came to me when I was looking at uh, Facebook, and a friend of mine who's very much into 3D printing um, highlighted this interesting company. So I got in touch 
And in a matter of days, basically, uh, I, I managed to get them to give a presentation. So thanks, Alexander, for uh, jumping in very, very quickly. So um, I'm going to start with Bruce because obviously Bruce has been doing this since 2007 and he's working in Revit and he's doing uh, digital design, BIM, and he's doing fabrication all within uh Revit plus his secret special source, which enables him to create G code, send it to site, and start um, milling uh, of wooden uh, boxes and to create architecture and residential houses. Um, today, Bruce has kind of uh, extended his vision for um, for that. In that, there is a distinct problem in 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 the industry of connecting manufacturing with architecture. All the architecture software to date has been created to create drawings and BIM. Bruce has managed to tag on his special uh, application to generate manufactured parts. But when uh, Bruce went and had a look at the industry, he found that obviously there was there's a disconnect between the two worlds. We're not speaking the same language. And so he kind of came up with this idea of confector, which um, uh, confactor, sorry, said wrong, um, which sounds uh, interesting. I know it's been tried before, so I'm kind of interested in how confactor differs from uh, BIM object and all those kind of uh, component suppliers to manufacturers. Um, thanks, Martin. Uh, I think the, the first thing is it's about creating content from a, a manufacturer's perspective, as in how can a manufacturer get value out of the content? And really that means that you're going to be able to extract data usefully and, you know, one way or another, make money from it. Um, and what we've identified as the simplest way to add value to the customer uh, to the manufacturer is that they can instantly get quotations out to their potential customers, which is, and not only is that an instant quotation, but that is something that's in, incredibly accurate and precise. Um, the amount of time that we spend in the past or have spent in the past getting quotations from manufacturers and you get back a long list of schedules of thousands of different bits and bobs in it and there is all wrong. and you know, you just waste so much time and that takes two to three weeks to get it. And then you're back through this really slow, cumbersome loop. So I think that, uh, that this is the kind of critical thing is if you can give the manufacturers value, then they will be willing to invest in it. I think that's the, the, the difference is that in the past, it's only been for really focused around marketing. The manufacturers would only spend a few thousand pounds on some content really just to get something out there. And really with, we're looking at this from uh, an advanced manufacturing perspective. You know, the, these companies have, have invested millions of pounds into systems like the SAP um, production information, uh, production management systems, you know, literally millions getting these things set up and they already exist. They're there. And this is a similar kind of level of, well, not a similar level of investment, but a similar kind of um, technological approach. You know, they've got very high tech approaches to quoting manufacturing, and this is a high tech approach to how to get that information in there in the first place. So it's not really focused on an open source um anybody can upload content to it, uh, libraries such as the stuff that we've seen in the past. This is a much more locked down, secure, guaranteed content. It, it, you can't, I don't, I think until um, uh, uh, certification has been adopted at scale or you have standards that everybody applies to, I think you can't take the same open source kind of approach. It's gotta be much more rigorous and, and closed in some way so that the people using the content can guarantee that it works. So you're working, I'm guessing, with uh, suppliers that you work with every day, uh, or are you actually reaching out to suppliers who maybe you're not using in facet homes at the moment? We will be. But at the moment, what we're trying to do is just absolutely hone 
our concepts, our ideas, and how it's going to look and feel, and and exactly the mechanics of it. So we're still in fairly early stage, uh, and we're talking to you know a limited um, set of of manufacturers who are interested. But as soon as that's fully fleshed out and we have something, then yeah, we're are absolutely going to be going beyond um, uh, beyond our current current set. So when you when you have a model in and you create it in Revit when you back at home. Hmm. Is this thing going to actually automatically always give you a feedback of how much and the lead time for uh, objects you're actually inserting into the model? Well, well, the way the way that we see it working is that you know you you will have a uh, a BIM model. So contractors got a BIM model which may have been worked on by an architect or may have been handed down the line. You open up that BIM model and you see right what's the compatible data in there. Um, and it says, well, you've got all these comp these components. Um, this is the approximate cost. Uh, this is the approximate lead time. Press here to get your quote, and you press there, and you get your quotation through and your information, and then you start going through to a more uh, formal uh, placing of that order. Interesting. I see. So I'm going to move on to Mark. I've got a question here from Max Troma of Rebotech. Uh, it's very interesting to see 3D printing moving out in the real world. How are the economics behind 3D printing of bridges? Is it already cheaper than conventional casting alternative? Do the 3D CP bridges have better carbon footprint? Um, yeah, I mean, the, we're using um, more cement in the concrete that we're using to print. Um, but we are using less material. So there's a trade-off between the design and uh, um, the design approaches that we take and uh, just using material where we need it and increasing the cement content uh, to uh, uh, to create the mortar mix we need uh, for, for printing. Um, from a cost perspective, where we're starting to see the benefits is with, with these... Um, where we have multiple types, similar bridges that are multiple, uh, we have a uh, type that we can print multiple times, uh, and then these economies of scale, and that's where we see the future in this type of thing, where we have a parametric design that we can, and the design principles locked in, and then we can just make um, these bridges uh, any um, for any situation and then uh, uh, print them um, uh, and install them. And, and that then the cost will come down uh, a lot more uh, for that, the, type of, that, that type of work, working. Is the, des is the design system behind it, is it kind of rhino parametrics or are you using a solid modeling tool? What, what's the design tool? Uh, it depends what we, where we're coming in on the process and who we're working with. So we work a lot with rhino. Um, and then straight through to G-code and uh, printing things. We also work with Revit and CAD-based systems. So we're taking those models, converting them uh, in, uh, in, in our uh, tooling. Uh, so we use things like um, PowerMill uh, to convert and create the tool paths and then uh, push them through into the, the robots. Because at the moment, I, I'm, I was very intrigued by the whiteboard image that uh, when you get a job in, that I can just imagine a bunch of you sat around a whiteboard wondering how to print it. Or is it, or can you automate that? Uh, you know? Well, that was the, the, the white, the, we, we've got, um, as part of the process is developing the process. Um, we've had to understand how the material behaves, what the limits are of the equipment. Um, and uh, we're now, now in a position where we through um, uh, testing and uh, that we can start to automate those processes. A lot of that knowledge is with our factory teams, um, yeah. but we are now trying to fully digitize our systems so that we can give a customer uh, at the outset a clear idea whether or not we can print their vision for uh, um, for you know for a bridge or for a, whatever it is that they they, they would like to print really. Yeah. So what QA process do you put in place to verify the quality? Because the, the, the concrete is constantly changing, isn't it? In terms of it needs to be 
sampled and measured to make sure that you have consistency and strength? Uh, well, it's the same. We, we test the, the cubes as we create test pieces that we crush uh, as we're printing. So there's a standard QA procedure in place for the concrete. The mix, okay. uh, the mix is very consistent because we use a, a hopper and dosing system that is really consistent, more consistent than you would find in a um, uh, in a normal concrete yeah. system. So it's basically the material is 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 uh, in the factory is it's done. And that's the advantage of doing it in the factory. It's a controlled environment. We can control the temperature. We can control. You know, so the environment's controlled, the uh, process is controlled fully, uh, you know, and it's automated, the dosing systems and, the, you know, we can train, to, you know, it, every, we've got controls on all of our systems in there. So there's much better quality, much improved Higher quality. quality. It can be, yeah, it can be achieved um, um, in that factory environment, and it's something that you can't do out on site. No. I'm going to move over to Alexander and just say uh, welcome. And also, um, what made you go for the shotcrete approach as opposed to the traditional uh, line by line growing up, um, laying down, and building shapes? Uh, actually, um, first of all, welcome to all the known faces in the audience. I see some uh, friends and uh, some, some other well-known people uh, uh, in, in the audience. So I can't see your face because we're, it's not a face-to-face -face conference, but I can still see your names. And that's great. Uh, it's great to, uh, great to meet you virtually. Uh, and thank you, Martin, for, um, for, for having us at the conference. Um, the decision for Shotcrete was not uh, taken by me personally. I'm the late joiner to the team. I have uh, three co-founders here at Additive, and um, the three of them research digital fabrication technologies for concrete and the, the research project um, that then kind of led us to found additive started with a very broad look at how to digitally manufacture concrete and um, shotcrete was not um, set as a technology from the very beginning so it was one option besides other options and I think what what led the team to pursue shotcrete as the, the nucleus of our technology is that it's it's a well-known process, so it's established in the industry. It's used in tunnel construction or um, the construction of swimming pools in the United States. It's, it, it has its um, use cases or areas of application. Um, there's a regulatory framework for it, which is a nice side effect of using an established technology, um, which also allows us to easier determine which type of tests we need to conduct on the printed elements to prove that they are in line with um, requirements. Um, plus also Shotcrete has some other obvious advantages. One is um, that you can easily integrate steel rebar, um, mm -hmm. as you've probably uh, seen in the video that was shown earlier. Um, plus it also allows to apply the material at various angles. So you can, uh, you can apply the material not only from the top, but also from the side, for example, or mm -hmm. at, at varying angles. And that's, of course, if you think about 3D printing and if you think about uh, the geom geometries that need to be created, not, in, not, not necessarily in very fancy elements, but even in those concrete precast elements that exist in the market today, that's a big advantage if you have that uh, option to apply material from different angles. Um, and I think this, this whole range of arguments led the team to pursue the shotcrete option and as it turned out, it's also um, it's probably um, a slightly more complex option on, on the range of technologies. Um, mm -hmm. But once you master it, it provides a bunch of advantages. So I've got a question here from Kevin Quigley. He's asking, how do you shape the steel reinforcement on a bespoke basis? Or is it manually or bent formed by robot? Um, so the steel reinforcement we currently use uh, is exactly the st same steel reinforcement that uh, users of our technology, so precast manufacturers, uh, would use in their current manufacturing, which is also meant to disrupt their current manufacturing process as little as possible. And um, thus, um, we, we, source the, we currently source these rebar cages 
uh, using the same processes um, that or supply chains that, that the users of our technology would source them from. So that means some of our customers would just buy the, the finished rebar cage, while others would buy the pre-bent elements and then manually um, assemble the cage. And others might just buy the steel and do both the bending and the assembly um, on site. Mm -hmm. But um, maybe as an as an outlook, of course, um, because our um, our approach really is to achieve this end to end degree of automation. Uh, we do have concepts uh, to automate the creation and integration of rebar as well, and to drive to drive automation in that process step uh, a lot further um, and a lot beyond what you've seen in the video. So I was noticing, obviously, you know, you've got quite a wide angle uh, of, of of laying down the shot creep so you can go around to the top and the sides. Mm -hmm. do, do you have any monitoring, uh, like laser scanning or something, which is looking for voids that might have been generated in uh, in shooting the, the, the concrete out so quickly? Yeah, so um, we, we do use sensor technology to determine um, how the material behaves. Um, but the, let's say the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the um, creating voids is mm -hmm. not the main problem we face, given that Shotcrete uses air and there's a lot of kinetic energy when we apply the material. We right. haven't really faced problems with voids. It's rather, I think, um, if you really, if you, if you really additively want to get to a point where you, where you um, have the right measurements, the right dimensions, um, mm -hmm. and a, a level of precision in, in terms of millimeters uh, for the finished elements, I think then it's really important that at the end of the process you're capable to measure what you have printed, and um, also once once uh, you look at the quality assurance process, you have a digital fabrication process. Why not use it to also document what you have printed mm -hmm. and then use that for quality assurance purposes as well? So yes, we do use sensor technology and we do not solely rely on um, on the, the, the idea that the concrete stays exactly where we've put it. Thank you. So going back to Bruce, I've got a question from Dennis McNeil of AECOM for you. Uh, will Facet bring their housing solutions and or Comfactor to the USA? Um, yeah, actually, um, we've had a few requests. Um, it's the, the kind of expansion of Facet as a business is something that we're very interested in. Um, but really what we are looking at the moment at is how can we kind of leverage the technology that Facet Homes has created. Um, we, we're we not particularly looking to um, spin out uh, like bigger versions of Facet Homes, but really just look at the technology that we've created and say, how can we add value to other people's projects? That's, that's my current plan. But um, I am interested to speak to all sorts of people. So I will be getting back to Dennis. Um, he's, he's on my uh, list of people to set up a Zoom meeting with. So uh, in the States, they're very much into CLT, uh, cross-laminated timber. And in the UK, there's a little bit of usage of it. Uh, we got some kind of, uh, since Grenfell, we had kind of obviously some negative interest in having flam or flammable materials, allegedly flammable materials. Um, how do you see uh, CLT usage in the UK expanding? Uh, well, until we've changed our policy, um, the CLT usage is, is being killed. I mean, it's it's really horrible what's happened. I mean, so many modular manufacturers, such as Swan Housing and um, Legal in General, were basing their their primary structural systems on CLT. And at the moment, everybody's canned it. I mean, it's it's crazy. It's super crazy. Um, but I think when people have kind of calmed down a bit and understood uh, the new legislation coming through, then maybe those the CLT can get back on the menu. Um, for, for us, you know, ours is a much more lightweight um, yeah. system. So it's, it's kind of a, a different, uh, different prospect. Um, one of the challenges that faces Facet Homes, though, is, is just the low spend that exists in the housing market. I mean, people still want to spend so little money on a house. Thing. It's, it's quite prohibitive still to really affect change in the housing market in terms of 
uh, advanced thinking and technology when you're still based uh, around producing houses for in just incredibly low costs. Um, that's, that's a difficult position to, to try and compete with. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Kevin Quigley's asked, uh, this is, uh, before we came on air, this is something that uh, Bruce and I were talking about. If the facet modeling system is so detailed, why do you use BIM? Even uh, if that, uh, even if it's what you'd actually call really BIM, wouldn't a typical MCAD system be more appropriate for your turnkey solution for design and build? Um, so, not quite sure I understand the question, but I think it's it's referring to. Well, maybe I'll speak a little bit more about the, the philosophy. So. What we have for both our own products, which is the, the manufactured structural system, uh, which we call the chassis, but also for other um, manufacturers' products that we use, is we, we create a kind of, we create two worlds. We create the world of, of Revit, which has the essential design information in it. And then we have the world of the back end, which is either the own manufacturer's own um, production system or our own production system. And the idea is to create these two worlds with the same set of parameters, the same strings to pull, so that you can downstream information. You know, so we have uh, all of just our design information sitting in Revit, which is just the information that we care about in terms of the design, the size, the access, the channels, the insulation holes, or whatever it will be. But we don't care in Revit if it, where the screws are. We don't care about the millimeter details. So our mirrored system, our other world, has all that information. And just as you might expect with the window manufacturer is a good example. You know, We don't want the gaskets in there. We don't want all of these tiny little micro details in our Revit model. But we do want to be able to um, shift the primary parameters to get the window made. So you end up with these two worlds of uh, the manufacturers, the window manufacturers production system, and then our model, which sits in Revit. And the, the aim is to be able to transfer information directly from Revit that goes straight into production that you don't worry about, that you don't have to re-put back into Revit to make sure it's right. So I see this a lot with um, secondary design systems where everything has to be checked and coordinated so you're, you're constantly chucking information out of Revit and back in. And actually, we're very happy working in the Revit environment because it's good for the design team, it's good for the client, it's good for visualization. There's so many good things about it. So actually, we've created a process that allows us to get around the limitations of it and still get the digital fabrication, the structural design, the, the accurate manufacturing, G-code, all of that stuff, right? Yeah, I get it. Um, I'm going on to uh, Mark. I've got a question from Tal Friedman, who's talking, I think, tomorrow. Um, do you think there's a chance we'll see structural concrete printing without the need for rebar for mass scale construction? Sorry, for what construction? Mass scale construction. Right. Um... So uh, do, do I think it's possible we could do it without rebar for mass scale construction? Yeah. Um, no, not. You'd have to change um, chemistry. I mean, we, yeah, I mean, it's not, we, we're using everything um, that we're doing is based on sort of, um, uh, you know, traditional design principles. We put, uh, we use um, either post-tensioned concrete or we add reinforcement into the layers of the, um, into the layers of the uh, of the element that we're printing, or we're mm -hmm. looking at um, additives to the to the concrete, uh, like uh, uh, concrete slabs. For years, we've put uh, like paperclip materials into the slabs instead of mesh. Uh, so looking at those sorts of additives, um, plastics and, um, uh, and and metals. Um, but also, uh, the, the, uh, in some instances, we just use the um, the elements we're printing as formwork for traditional uh, reinforced concrete elements, so that you get like a, uh, with the bridges that we're doing, or one of them we're doing, it's so that the whole thing has that whole organic feel and shape and form. But then the structure is actually uh, being used as a formwork for the 
columns. Um, um, but then the rest of it is, is, is kind of tension together and held together. So it wouldn't take reinforcement out. Not yet. For those amazing um, houses that you're, is it the in Eindhoven, the ones that haven't been built yet? There was a, I, I seem to remember there was an issue with planning to start with. Has that been resolved? Yeah, um, we've printed them now. I think that was the last video on my uh, um, yeah. presentation. We've um, finished though printing those, uh, and they're now ready for delivery. Um, when the projects, when the projects, that's the only problem with manufacturing things. We end up with a lot of things in the uh, uh, warehouse ready to go to site because we're waiting for somebody to put something flat down so we can take it out to site. <laughs> So they'll be up this this winter, or you hope? I, b I believe so. Yeah, I think we're um, yeah. The it, it is ready. The project's ready to go. So um, in the next few months, I look forward to going and visiting them. Hopefully, uh, post COVID. Uh, going to Alexander. I've got a question from Charles Overy of LGM. Is three D printing in situ not practical? Um, not at the moment. I mean, we, we can oh, do think, it, um, and we've tested the, it that is, as a uh, use case. Sure. Oh, hang on. Oh, sorry, I was, but, sorry, I was <laughs> answering. <laughs> you can both answer, but Alex, Alexander, answer first, and we'll go back to Mark. Yeah. Go, Alexander. Okay, um, so um, well, our our decision to work with and to focus on producing modules and not entire buildings and, and not to start with in situ printing is because we ultimately believe it it will permit a higher degree of end to end automation. So. Um, to give you one example, um, integrating built in parts uh, is something that we can handle quite easily with our setup, with a uh, setup that is built uh, built around industrial robots. Um, and and um, it's a lot easier um, if you have a large collaborative area and you one robot can place an element while the other prints the concrete, for example. And thus, uh, we at the moment, we focus on um, printing modules, which is similar to precast manufacturing. And we do that in a precast-like setting uh, instead of working in situ and instead of, um, well, focusing on entire buildings. And Mark? I think I was, I was just going to say the same. We're a bit limited when it comes to printing on site in terms of, at the minute, we can only use one. Uh, we've got a system that we can, uh, a mobile system. But we have to. It has to be fixed level, stable, and then um, you know we can print, uh, and we're limited on what ax on the axes of of that robot. Um, so it does limit us uh, currently. But in the future, um, it, it it may be entirely possible to 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 have a rig that you can bring in, and and um, I know there are gantry systems that are being used to print buildings and things like that. Um, but for our uh, project, we're maybe looking at, because um, we're using multi-axis robots, uh, mm -hmm. using them in the factory, it's, it's more, uh, it gives us more flexibility in, for the product that we can deliver. Um, um, so I think we're, we're, we're looking at that side of things more. A lot of the buildings that I've seen tended to have been in Saudi Arabia or Dubai, where they don't quite have the same weather problems that um, somewhere like the UK or Europe has. I'll bring in Bruce because he's got something he wants to add. Yeah, I'd just like to say because we, so we've done a whole bunch of manufacturing on site using uh, CNC cutting for, for some of our projects. and. At the moment, we do most of our fabrication off-site, um, so I've kind of had experience of both sides. But I have to say that building manufacturing on-site is an amazingly powerful thing. You know, you don't have to be 3D printing in its final position, but mm -hmm. the if you can get it to work, 
the effort that it removes where you're not having to keep things in your warehouse, the logistics, the shipping, the costs. I mean, it, it makes a huge difference. And actually, whilst the idea of 3D printing in its final position might not appeal, uh, 3D printing uh, at the location of your, of your building could be incredibly powerful, I think. Um, so I, 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 I would like to see more people trying to use technology on site. I think it's um, uh, what the opportunities it brings are really quite exciting. Maybe this is an opportunity to fast at home to have uh, some free printed concrete parts. Yeah, absolutely. Love to. <laughs> so, um, so, Alexander, what kind of physical testing do you do for your concrete parts and your units? It's uh, pretty much in line with what you would do with other um, uh, precast elements that are manufactured in a traditional way. There are some uh, bits and pieces you have to add to the uh, test procedures, given that the, the, the regulatory framework for shotcrete has some additional uh, tests that it would require, but it's literally all the, well, standard tests, and therefore it's also something that can be conducted by any um, concrete manufacturer, any precast manufacturer, as they have the, uh, let's say, processes in place, and also the, the skills and potentially even the, the uh, lab capacities to conduct these tests either themselves or by using an, a third-party lab. And another question from me. So you rapidly 3D print using Shotcrete. You then form and finish with another robot. I, I, I've always seen robots as not being particularly quick, and yet the aim of the Shotcrete is to have very fast setting concrete. So uh, do you have especially fast robots to do the finishing, or is there always a bit of a race? <laughs> Um, well, the, um, to, to be honest, the robots are not the uh, restriction in terms of speed. And I think if you look at the typical um, volume of batching plants, of concrete pumps, so all the, let's say, the entire process chain, I would, I would assume that um, if you make the right choices in hardware, probably still the robots are the easiest element um, to scale in terms of um, speed. And they are really good at um, not only moving into one direction, but also, um, well, moving in curves at high speed, changing speeds, changing direction. Um, and, and thus we, ha we didn't have any, didn't experience any restrictions in terms of speed from these industrial uh, robots. It's rather, I think the challenge really is if you create any type of concrete that you want to print with, it has to have certain parameters and concrete, as you know better than I, um, it maintains these parameters, these properties only for a certain period of time. So your entire process chain from batching the concrete over pumping it up to um, printing it needs to be mm -hmm. really, really well aligned. Um, and you need to have a lot of intelligence in that process change to determine any deviations in the quality of your concrete so that you can then um, adjust the process accordingly. What's the largest build volume that you can do at the moment with your current setup? So we operate at um, uh, three cubic meters output uh, per hour. Um, but that's, of course, uh, a, um, let's say, a, a gross or yeah, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a gross output, which means, of course, if you have to smoothen the surface, if you have to, um, uh, if, if the robot needs to move from A to B and it doesn't print at the time, then your your net output will be will be lower. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, uh, um, uh, what software do you use to, to do the maths in? To do the, the the you're creating it yourselves? Do you license components from? CAD companies that we might know about? So we, um, I think it's uh, public public knowledge um, also from, from some of our um, previous posts is uh, we, um, we also use uh, Rhino uh, and on top of Rhino um, use a couple of plugins that we use to automate. Um, but then um, when, once we are beyond Rhino, beyond the planning phase, uh, the, the software is entirely proprietary. 
So um, although the back-end systems we use, front-end systems we use, and also the entire interface and all the, the software that we use on the printer is proprietary software. Wow, okay. So, and that's been in development for two years. Well, we uh, we started Additive in 2019, so we we um, we started to develop that software slightly more than a year ago. But um, yeah, as I've tried to outline in our in our little video contribution, um, I think we've been pretty fast on both the hardware side and the software side, um, uh, and that's mainly because we've we've applied agile principles from the very beginning. So we set priorities and we focus all the engineering efforts on these priorities and then we had some second priority issues like making user interfaces beautiful and that's something that we've um we've spared for a later point in time okay so going back to bruce i've got a question here from kevin quigley for your instant quote subcontracting manufacturers do you use just one supplier per type of product or multiples it's going to be multiples i mean that's the the, the aim is that in the future it can look something a little bit more akin to a marketplace. Um, how long that might take, I don't know. But the, you know, where you want to get to as a contractor is that you can, you can see, okay, I've got this particular window manufacturer's product in here. If I went to an alternative manufacturer's product, um, the price would be between here and here, which can be um, you can build up the data over time through through the sales and quotation. Okay, and I've got a one from John Buxton. How does Facet Homes assess the quality of third-party downloaded content, e.g. level of detail, model quality, metadata, et cetera? Do you have a set process and standards? Yeah, we, we're starting to build a kind of framework for assessing it. Uh, and it's not it's not so much assessing it, but it's, it's defining our criteria because we're going to be creating content from scratch pretty much because you know, you, the what we find find out there is that it's just incredibly inconsistent. But yes, it's it's first of all, is the content built with a good framework? Has it got the right underlying yeah. parameters building it? Um, does it have the appropriate levels of detail? Um, does it match the product? Uh, it, are the user features there? Just really basic stuff, which seems to be lacking in just so much of the the content that's out there. So yeah, we, we're, we're building a framework of our own. And um, to begin with, we're gonna be building all of the content ourselves um, and, until we've established a framework with, with which other people can engage with. That'll be interesting. <laughs> so I've got a final question here from Carla Lauter, uh, which I think all of you can have a crack at. Um, it's what can the future generation of AEC professionals do to prepare or train for how to work with generative design, 3D printing at scale. What are the critical skills that people need uh, to make use of this technology? If we go with Mark first. Uh, I think it's a, a um, I don't know, I'm teaching my kids to code at the minute. So um, that's where I'm starting because I, before I start teaching them Revit or anything like that, I'm. Uh, uh, teaching them, uh, yeah, how to code things, and uh, uh, I think that's, yeah, for me, that's where to start. Uh, Alexander, what do you think? I agree to what Mark said, and I think really, uh, if it's about now accelerating 3D printing and accelerating digital manufacturing processes, it's all about looking for patterns, because of course, um, uh, acceleration happens when you decouple uh, the the process in the market. So if you decouple what our users, our, what our customers can do from our own engineering capacities, and that's um, I think what our engineers do uh, is to to look at patterns, to identify patterns in um, reinforcement, uh, patterns in regulations, patterns in um, well print strategies, how you print certain types of elements, how you print certain geometric shapes, uh, how the robot moves. Um, so if you think in patterns, I think that that really that really helps drive the uh, rate of adoption and because it decouples the the, uh, the the speed of technical development from the the engineering capacities that you have on your team. And um, Bruce? Uh, I would say 
it, it, I would look to break down the silos that exist, um, the separation between design architecture and architects and products and manufacturers. I, I see a very distinct line that exists. And actually, to actually be able to do what we do, for example, we need to understand manufacturing and we need to understand architecture and we need architects and manufacturers and product designers working side by side. So it's that collaborative aspect that, that, that is a critical factor in enabling it. So I think if I was uh, somebody young coming into this industry, I would get as much varied experience as possible. I would want to get experience of designing within architecture practice, and I would want to go out there and get experience of working in a manufacturing company. I mean, that's literally all Facet Homes is. It's experience of two worlds and saying, how do we jam these things together and get it to function in something that's useful? So when you look to hire people for Facet Homes, are you more likely to hire someone who is an architect or someone who is a manufacturer, come from a manufacturing background, or are you looking for people who are hybrids, or do those people actually exist? I know you've kind of so made yourself. They, they're starting to exist. So um, Matt, who's probably listening, who's actually going to go and work for, for Mark here, uh, has worked with us for the last couple of years. Um, he's come from UCL's Design for Manufacture course, which is a really architecture hybrid making manufacture design computational course. It's amazing. Um, so, but actually, they're they're very few and far between. Uh, and actually, if you look at our studio, it's just built up of different industries. We've got people who are CAD CAM specialists, people who are product designers. We have architects. Then we have people who are more general um, uh, financial specialists and all the rest of it. And it's it's really that kind of cl cross collaboration in a studio of everybody literally sitting side by side and working together is how it works. And you can't, you know, the, 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 there is few people who really do have um, that background in multiple different industries. So quite a lot of the time we have a a long lead-in with new staff, um, showing them what we do and how we operate and how it's different to what they might have done before. What I'm hearing from all three of you really is if any company wants to get um, uh, involved in this research or start thinking about it, it's maybe it's to get in touch with and work with local universities who have a proven track record or have an interest in this because you're going to get people who come, are going to come and work for you People are going to intern for you. Um, maybe they can go and problem solve for you. So it's about finding those really good institutions who are uh, on the edge of this. And I think if you go back and watch the first uh, virtual one, which was Thursdays, uh, we've got Elif Dean from the AA who's talking about how she's working with Borough Happel to do a lot of project work. Um, and Molly Claypool as well was also working with... Um, companies and manufacturers to to also solve design problems in communities so it, it it's great to see that the universities are actually uh their research is now becoming real or, or functional at least um I'm trying to think if there's any more questions going through my list um Nope, that's all the questions. We've done all the questions from the audience. So I'd like to thank Bruce, Mark, and Alexander for their time and for putting their talks together. Um, if you've uh, logged in, you can log in and watch the streams again. Um, I think they're available pretty much immediately after we finished, and so is the Q&A. Um, and so I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time out today and uh, watching us, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.